so far as we know, almost from the very beginning, we've looked up at the stars and asked, why are we here? What does a universe of mind-stumping creativity want from you and me? I think I figured it out. I've done six books, and the six books don't even touch the surface of this. I just hope I can get the whole thing down before I croak. Saucer cups, glasses, keys, cell phone, business cards, computer battery, camera battery, Wi-Fi stick. I've been Howard's assistant for four years. It's mostly administrative. I pay his bills. He owns this building, so I deal with the tenants, take rent checks. There is never a boring day. I wasn't alive for the most of uh, his music industry career and his publicist career. Um, and I was only four when um, he, he got sick and retired basically from that. So the only reason I know about that is through my parents who are big music fans.
This was the most gorgeous tour jacket I've ever, ever, ever seen in my life. Look at the piping. It's an amazing work of art. Isn't this fabulous? Bless Luther. In the fall of 1967, I taught a course called Physiological Psychology. Among the students in it was Howard Bloom. He was very interested in the material, in the brain and how it processes information and how we perceive things and our emotions and so forth. About that time, I was getting connected with a new disco that had opened up called the Electric Circus. And they would allow me to bring my entire class in. Among all the people, the one person who really got turned on in the strobes and everything that was going on was Howard, and he was prancing around. Everybody knew from the time I was 10 years old I was going to be a college professor. But I got interested in the mass emotions that power the forces of history. And there was an energy in the electric circus you could never observe in the lab. To me, grad school looked like Auschwitz for the mind. Here I was fascinated by the beating heart of culture where the myths and historical forces are made. And there was no way I was gonna get anywhere near that in grad school. And then I got this opportunity to co-found a commercial art studio. And it brought me into a field I knew absolutely nothing about, pop culture. And by the third year, this was on the cover of Art Direction magazine. It's a picture of me walking into an art director's office, shocking this poor, <laughs> chagrined man. And that led eventually to founding the biggest PR firm in the music industry. I ended up working with Michael Jackson, Prince, Bob Marley, Bette Midler, ACDC, Kiss, Queen, David Byrne, etc. It was my way of adventuring in the forces of history. If you came to me as an artist, I gave you a speech. And I said, if you expect me to fashion an artificial mask, and tell you that I'll make you a star with that mask, then I'm gonna send you to my best competitor immediately. If you're gonna work with me, you have to understand that music is an exchange of souls. And what I will do is I will research the ass off of you. And what am I looking for? I'm looking for your soul. So I can introduce your soul to you and show you how to speak on behalf of your soul. I love to take people who have a genuine authenticity and get that authenticity across. When we met Howard, the Blackhearts were relocating to New York, and he helped us get going here in New York. We went to Howard, and he took us on for free for a year. He deferred all the payments because he saw something in Joan. He believed in a lot of people that made it to the top. And it would be like one after another, a Howard Bloom client would have a number one record. And finally, Joan followed suit. God, I didn't know there were this many in here. Um, this is Cool on the Gang, who I worked very hard on. Who is this? Simply Red. Ah, a great vocalist. 
I should probably put my glasses on so I can see what these are. Oh, it's Daryl Hall and John Oates. Really a terrific group. Maneater is one of the greatest songs of all time. Cameo, which was also a terrific band. Ah! Okay, I hope that survived. This is Run DMC. We made rap, a movement that I was told was gonna explode and leave shit all over my face, that it was shit and it would disappear in six years. And I was told I should not work with it. Fuck that. I haven't seen these since 1987, something like that. To me, it was really obvious how strong he believed and went to the mat for you. Maybe all that passion for other people, intense passion, because it's all energy, you know, and energy is real, it's a real thing. Maybe that had something to do with him becoming ill. Like he would probably say, you know, there's a reason for all this. You know, the, uni the cosmos, however you want to phrase it, wants us doing our passion, then yeah. It's a funny way of getting you there sometimes. This cosmos has been around for 13.7 billion years. It's had catastrophe after catastrophe after catastrophe. But nature makes creative use from the embers. A star is a catastrophe. It pulls atoms into its heart and yanks them to pieces. And what we see, the stuff we call light, that's the screams of dying nuclei. Again and again, nature destroys to create. CFS is chronic fatigue syndrome. That's the illness that hit me in 1988. It is a devastating, brutal, ghastly disease. It meant I was too weak to talk, and I was too weak to have another person in the room with me. I felt like all the circuit boards had been removed from my mind and I didn't even have the energy it takes to be bored. I gave the company to my staff, and from 1988 to 2003, I was a prisoner of a bedroom. I was 45 when I got sick, and I didn't have the strength to leave my apartment again until I was 60. It cut all of my sense of a future self. And one of the few things that I had left was my marriage. And so I begged my wife not to divorce me. And she divorced me anyway. And it forced me to focus on what was more really me than anything else. And ultimately, that's a gift. Because life puts all kinds of obstacles between you and your most essential self. And in my case, life took all the obstacles away. I grew up as an outsider. No social group ever wanted me. But when I was 10 years old, I was introduced to a group of people who couldn't say no to me. Like Galileo, Anton von Leeuwenhoek, and Albert Einstein. The scientific community gave me something worth holding on to. I 
I suddenly realized all I'd been reading was books about business. So I went back to my science. I started catching up on the things that had happened since I'd gotten out of school. I started reading things like Edward O. Wilson's Sociobiology and Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene. And I started putting together my own book. On tonight's show, you'll meet an extraordinary character, my dear friend, Howard Bloom. We are children of the evolutionary process. And the evolutionary process happens to work by using destruction for creation. I asked my good buddy, what's the purpose of violence? He said, there's a book you might want to check out, The Lucifer Principle. Man, I found it fascinating. Howard shows how nature sharpens its scalpel to make uh, groovier beings and things. And, uh, that's, that's the way uh, the universe works. It, it pits us against each other. The Lucifer Principle shows how both evil and good can be explained from an evolutionary perspective. It's a product of group selection. Group selection is a theory that tells us when uh, social groups can evolve to be adaptive in the same way that individuals are adaptive. The fact that the Lucifer Principle came out in 1997, uh, that was one year before uh, my academic book on the topic, uh, shows you how, you know, how basically Howard was ahead of the curve. When he reached out to us academics, I could see that I was dealing with a very intelligent person. He was a total outsider, but uh, very well read, an intellectual uh, in his own right. Well, it was sad to know that he was suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome. Amazing, really, that he could uh, maintain a very active agenda despite that. The writing held me together. It gave me work to do. And I never stopped looking for salvation, for something that would lift me out of this horrible thing. I never thought I'd get out of bed again in my life. But I slowly worked out one thing after another that helped a little tiny bit until all the little tiny bits added up. But I'm now stronger than I've ever been in my life. I could do 92 push-ups. At my best a year and a half ago, I did 1,600 without stopping. So this little pile of paper where I keep track of the push-ups goes back roughly 20 years. push-ups I've only been doing for seven years. So God knows what's on the archaeological layers of paper way down below that, all kinds of other things I've had to keep track of to work out a routine that would allow me to get out of bed and out of my bedroom and function again. I sleep in two shifts of four hours each. So I get up at eight, immediately do my push-ups and my calisthenics. I take all of my pills, I give myself my shot, and I go over the list of what my assistant has to do, call her in, and we go over the list together. This film hurts. I eat breakfast, I go to sleep at 11 o'clock in the morning. I try to be a 24-hour-a-day information processing device. I have podcasts going while I'm sleeping. 
of social programs. I get up again at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, again, take roughly 30 different medications. I walk three miles through the park to the Cocoa Bar, and at the Cocoa Bar, I do my work until they throw me out at 10.30. I then take another walk through the park. I head for home. I work again until about 2 o'clock in the morning. I make dinner. I finish dinner at 4 o'clock in the morning. I go to sleep, and then the whole routine resumes. internet, science, curiosity. Those were the tools that helped me finally get out of bed. But once I achieved that goal, I needed another one, and then another one. I realized that maybe we're not alive to achieve goals, maybe we're alive to pursue them. Each of my books explored a different facet of human nature and how it fits into the cosmos. The Lucifer Principle is about the dark side of creation. Global Brain is about how we life forms have been knitted together since the beginning of life four billion years ago. The Genius of the Beast says there is a hidden mandate in capitalism, save thy neighbor. The God Problem explores how a universe manages to belch out one astonishing new creation after another. The Mohammed Code is about the most astonishing imperialist civilization in the history of mankind. And the sixth book, How I Accidentally Started the 60s, is a comic memoir of how I accidentally helped start the hippie movement. I'm still hunting down the forces of history, and I've been putting everything on the timeline of the universe and pulling it together. So this is a little 565-page document. It's a table of contents. It's a table of contents to the body of work that's my body of work. So this is called the Grand Unified Theory of Everything in the Universe, including the Human Soul. There's all kinds of weird stuff in here. The mind and brain, uh, each group member plays a different part. Masculinity in sexless lizards. What does the hypothalamus do? The myth that progress is a myth. Um, what scientists repress. There are over 9,000 of these chapters.
So there will be a Howard Bloom Institute when I croak, and they can worry about what to do with this stuff. But that's not a good thing to say because the integument, the stuff that keeps it all together, the glue is in here. And once I'm gone, that glue is gone. And it's gonna be very hard for anybody to figure out how all of these things related to each other. Once upon a time, there was a bunch of dinosaurs who basically said that their parents are not interested in hanging around on Earth. They want to go to the sky. Now, if you were their parent, you would have said, you're crazy. Well, the loony dinosaurs who wanted to fly did. Today, how many dinosaurs do you see on the street? Zero. How many of the loony dinosaurs who flew do you see? Hundreds, because they're called birds. Is nature trying to deliver us a message? Look up, not down. I wrote a chapter in my book, The Lucifer Principle, about space and its importance. And that brought me together with people like Buzz Aldrin and Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man on the moon. And together we tried to raise public awareness of things like space colonization and space solar power. I've now spent 12 years in the space community as an insider. I was invited to Caltech to work on a project that boiled down to a multi-planetary smart tile. And that multi-planetary smart tile team is on its way to creating a real deal piece of hardware that could be the energy infrastructure for the solar system. We're talking about the fact that we need to know where the state is of miniaturized power beaming so that Kelvin can put it into the prototype. I think our main bullets after this meeting should be starting to think about the technical details of how this is going to work in low Earth orbit. And just if we're as close as we thought we were. Probably yeah. send that out. Okay. okay. I'll put it together. I'll send it out. Terrific. Okay, so we'll see you in two weeks and we'll have a little bit more concrete idea of uh, where we're going. So th this has been a great meeting. And we'll see you in two weeks. Okay, goodbye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Dr. Kalam was the 11th president of India. He was a space scientist and the person who was responsible for giving India its nuclear power. And since the time of his passage, this institution has been working on the visions of Dr. Kalam. There is one photo right there, and that is his uh, friend, Howard Bloom. He's part of our advisory board, and we regularly take inputs and feedback from him, especially on things related to future and science. We found out about Howard uh, for the first time. At the end of 2010, this mail comes. The subject line read, space, solar power. It was the first time we heard the idea which Howard gave of extracting energy from space. Dr. Kalam became completely sold to this idea. I have been advocating a world space vision 2050. Number one was large scale societal mission, including space solar power mission, leading to a livable planet yet through space industrialization. 
space did give me one more community in which I could participate and in which I seemed to be appreciated. The more people show an obvious need and want for you, the easier it is to stay alive. On the one hand, you're seeking a personal source of meaning and just the sense that you're worth something. What does the human spirit ache for? It aches to go places that no human has ever gone before. And unless you tap that energy, you don't have a viable civilization. But ultimately, you're contributing to a very long historical and evolutionary arc of the universe. Because those smart tiles, those modules for an energy infrastructure for the solar system have never existed before in the history of the cosmos. So you're not just doing something on behalf of your own personal survival for another questionable day. I've got keys. I've got a cell phone. You're contributing to the cosmos creative process. Aha. Uh -huh. If you look across. Meanwhile, I'm also looking for a new girlfriend, but I don't have very much time to put into that at all. I took uh, the woman who writes for the New York Times and Psychology Today out to dinner twice, which I normally don't do. I normally don't eat with other human beings present. That worked out okay. Um, although the food across the street from the studio where I do my podcast is an Applebee's. Walk into the Applebee's, open the menu, and you see the most delicious looking items on the menu you've ever seen in your life, photographs of them. But of course, suggest to a person who writes the New York Times that you go to an Applebee's and that person will despise you for the rest of your life. So we went to a, uh, a Russian restaurant. The food was so mediocre, it was ridiculous, and they didn't have the things that she wanted. We would have been so much better off at Applebee's. Finding your passion, pursuing your goals, all of that means nothing without connection to others. That connection is as vital as the air we breathe and the food we eat. Attention is the oxygen of the human soul. Yes, you are adorable. Yes, you are, dear. Absolutely an adorable puppy. You're a big baby. Okay, baby paws. When I was a little kid, my parents really didn't have any time for me. No other children wanted me in Buffalo, New York. It was a lonely childhood. And on one of those few occasions when my dad was able to take me outdoors, a dog licked my face. I was terrified. And my dad said, don't worry about it. He's just kissing you. It felt like the first time I'd ever gotten a kiss in my life. At least the first time I'd ever gotten a genuine kiss by somebody who was really enthusiastic and was pouring out unconditional love. So I've gotten my unconditional love from dogs ever since. OK, thank you very much. Stop, 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 so I can catch up with the puppy. Yes, that's right, yes. Of course you're wonderful. Of course you are. You little nibblekins. Yes. You big wumpy mump. Big wumpy mump. Yes, I appreciate you too.
we're on our way to sign a will. I'm taking this building, the only thing I really own, and I'm leaving it to my biggest fan, Amir Siddiqui, so he can start a Howard Bloom Institute when I'm gone. When I first met him online, I was in bed. I thought I'd never get out of this bedroom again in my life. He was there catching me in my most fallen state. And boy, did I need that strength to have somebody who you know believes in you. He was in Islamabad. He was the trainer to the stars of the national cricket team in Pakistan, which is like being the trainer to LeBron James in the United States. And uh, then he started a business in Dubai. I wrote the ad copy for his business in Dubai. Symmetry is a passion project, an anti-gym that focuses only on hyper-individualized fitness solutions, the most serious and sophisticated exercise program in the city. We've never met in person. I'll probably be frightened if I meet him because he's huge and I'm little. But I know his soul. He's been giving me strength for 15 years and I hope that I've been giving him strength for 15 years as well. have taken the full body of my work and put it on an eight terabyte hard drive and sent it to him. And we'll do periodic backups in the future so that we bring him up to date. I have no concern about what physical location the Howard Loom Institute is in, as long as it's up there in the cloud and well taken care of and backed up. It is hard to contemplate your own death because you don't want your death to dominate you. Tomorrow, I'll be 74 years old. I've been afraid that the mere fact that I'm past the age of 70 would keep some people away from my birthday party. The birthday party, it's usually a very interesting group. So <laughs> how are you? I haven't seen you in a long time. I was hoping you'd come. This is Stuart Pivar. This is Richard Konigsberg. Hi, how are you? Yes, thank you very much. Oh, oh, Johnny, hi, Johnny, how good are you? you? Yes, it's good to see you. So Anne runs the financial aspect of the food co-op. Raphael is one of the few people on planet Earth who makes a living by selling his paintings. Maruf is from Turkey. He's a computer scientist who designs apps, and he's got a video game he's working on. And Stuart made his money in plastics, which allowed him to be a, an intellect. And so, I mean, uh, and you should. How do you know I wasn't an intellect beforehand? I'm sure you were an intellect. So Alex puts together books and I'm in one of those books. John Gisilli is uh, an attorney who lives down the block. When I was sick in bed, he was kind enough to come over so we could discuss metaphysics and evolutionary biology and stuff like that. Then he was kind enough to be my divorce attorney, which means that all the wealth from this house moved up the block four houses to John's house. So then they tore it down to 16 houses. Look up my Amir is able to pull in very big people, and his business in Dubai is now known as the most expensive gym in Dubai. 
So everything that I own will go to him. If the, if the will does what I, no, 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 you've already got most of my wealth, John. Um, we all need to be liked, us humans. And we all go through moments of insecurity where we're absolutely sure that we're not liked. So I need the same damn thing as a six-year-old child or anybody else. Oh, look who's here. It's Patrick. And he's going to ignore me. Now he's ignoring me for a good reason. He's got more important things to do. Oh my goodness, all of that coming out of a little tiny body like that, and he's not finished yet. About Howard, author of six books, regular on 500 radio stations, and it says my current work is as founder at the Space Development Steering Committee, and I should probably change that to co-founder and chair of the Asian Space Technology Summit, but who knows? I never know what to say to these people. What I said, for example, with this person is, what sort of work do you do? Um, with uh, this person, ah, you live in the East Village. Uh, with this person, do you like books? I write them. We'll take a look and see if any of these people are of interest. S-U-P, what does S-U-P mean? Hike, bike, sand, surf, run, movies, theater, travel. I don't have time for these kinds of frivolous leisure activities, so I guess that she's too into leisure for me. No, she's cute, but it doesn't say a thing about her. I am working for a Vietnamese restaurant as a chef six days a week, off Monday, well, she works most of the time. That's good for me. We'll just mark her a plus. It's a match. Now what do I do? Um, send a message. I'm just going to say, hi, on. how are you? It's stupid, but sorry, it's the best I can do is stupid. The end game is infinite. The stair steps I've built are sturdy and behind me. The next stair steps are in the process of being built, but they're not there yet. And this process goes on forever because the task is to reach out across 350 years and save some poor kid with my books and my work the way that I was saved by Galileo and Anton von Leeuwenhoek, who had reached out across 350 years to catch and save me. And the higher the platform you build, the more likely you are to be able to reach out across that distance of years. Let's see if we can say hello to this puppy. Yes, dear, of course you deserve attention. No, we wouldn't walk past without saying hello to you. We wouldn't do that. How old is the puppy? Cosmos is constantly climbing a staircase of astonishments. Atoms, planets, galaxies, human beings. These are all shocking creations that would have seemed utterly impossible before they came into existence. Nature is constantly exploring her potential, and we humans are the latest tool for her to create new astonishments. So when you think about it that way, all the cosmos really wants from us is to live the most shocking lives we can.
Maybe his next assistant can convince him to just use Gmail instead of AOL. It will be a wonderful, wonderful thing. I'm going to be leaving Howard. It's been almost five years as his assistant. Hello? The phone interview is basically they give people a Hi. decent idea of what the position is, because the ads that Howard writes are like three or four sentences, so you don't know what the job actually is. I don't have like a term or a label for Howard Bloom other than Howard Bloom. I just kind of ramble on until the person gets it or not. Species invent niches, period. Niches do not pre-exist, period. We're on our way to Purdue University. I very seldom get invited to give lectures, and I love doing it. I want to show them how to look for hidden assumptions and question those hidden assumptions. Look at this. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have to look at this. Amazing car. 10th Pan American Games. So this is sports stuff. How useless. Oh, I see. The Indy races take place here in Indiana. How dumb of me. Um, so these are cars from the Indy races. You know, okay, we're keeping Kyle waiting. We just checked out two cars. Uh -huh. They're amazing looking. Uh -huh. It took me a while to connect with the fact that the Indy races happen here in Indiana. Yes. Uh -huh. Every year, the cohort for the Ecological Sciences and Engineering program puts on a symposium. The title of the symposium this year was Trajectories, an exploration of paradigm shifts and their impacts across time. And from right when we had that theme and title, I instantly thought of Howard. less than the last time you shot. But, uh, okay, let's write it down before I forget. Nice to see you. How's the Wi-Fi in here? It's pretty good. Oh, good. Why did the universe begin? This is the ultimate why. The why that all others eventually lead back to. For this question, however, it makes no sense to ask why. You must instead ask how. Howard Bloom, that is. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present to you Howard Bloom. That's terrific. Try this. Take your left finger, your right palm, and now move your finger through your palm. Did it go through? What stopped it? 
protons. How old are those protons? 13.1 billion years old. So you are the Big Bang in its latest form. And you are not only made of protons, you're made of these incredible social dances of protons called elements, called atoms. And those atoms and their incredible social dances called molecules, and molecules and their incredible social dances called DNA and a cell. And that's what you are, an aggregation of stuff from the Big Bang come together in astonishingly, unbelievably, shockingly, surprising new ways. So our job is to be unbelievable and shocking, because that's what nature loves. Life is an upstart. Life is a paradigm shifter. Life is a rebel against nature's ways. Life is not a respecter of the planet. It is this plant's remodeler. Life is this plant's remaker and upgrader. Life re-engineered this poison pill of stone. It was life that turned nature livable. The early atmosphere on the planet giving people new ways of thinking, giving them new ways in which to see everything around them and everything inside of them. That's my job. And I will do it until the minute I lose the ability to speak. If you have a path that is uniquely yours, you have to persist with all the might you can muster It's time to look at what's under her nose and to radically re-perceive everything. Well, I first discovered Howard probably about six years ago. What immediately struck me was his perspective on nature in the whole and human nature itself. One thing he talks about is something that he learned from working in the music industry, like how musicians were able to bring their inner passions out in a way that no one else was able to do, their true selves. So that's something that I've also tried to take away. There are two ways to achieving immortality. One is the genetic way, have children. The other is to have ideas. I'm committed to the second approach, which means that for me, it is more important to preserve my work than merely to finish it. Yes, come over and say hello. Yes, how are you? Yes, what adorables. Oh, they're both adorable. Thank you. What a pair. Well, thank you for bringing them over. Have a nice day. You too. Um, so, these bacterial colonies. Stromatolites are pretty substantial hunks of stone. Well, they're created by bacterial colonies with seven trillion individuals, more individuals than all the humans who've ever lived on the face of planet Earth, ever. They glue bits of sand in place and leave an incrustation 
but over the course of time, you get something that is like humans building an entire planet. That's what we are doing with human culture. When I try to leave a legacy, I know it's only going to be the thickness of an incrustation. But it's indispensable to the future of humanity because we are our culture. My contribution is to leave an incrustation of ideas. These are two audio recorders. They record all the time that I'm awake. And the resulting files are loaded up to the computer. No one will listen to them in my lifetime, but if somebody wants a slice of life of a very peculiar human in the 21st century, the data will be there. I've always considered Howard to be my intellectual mentor. Every single idea that I've researched, I did because he mentioned something about it. So I owe Howard everything. I'm in New York, been assigned the deposition for his remains. You know, if he's talking about this stuff, there may not be too much time. Holy moly. <laughs> you got here. Oh, what the hell are you? Come, we'll go upstairs. Crystal, this is Amir. Hi. Amir, How are this you? is Crystal. Nice Here, let's head out into the back Do you room. Have the documents yes. So I'll just sign here. Okay. It's just three documents. The same documents. And okay. I'm already signed, right? You're already signed, you're good to go. Right, okay. And I'll just send them out and I'll give you a copy, Amir. Okay. Okay, and that is it. Awesome. Thank God, at last. Is it possible for you to take a picture of me and Howard? Let's get closer in. So what is aging? What, what is, is out? aging? This is a good question. What does nature get out of aging us? Um, among other things, what nature gets is the ability to use imprinting and to imprint fresh generations on fresh things so that each generation imprints on the achievements of the generation before, and then builds from that. Nature invented death, nature invented pain, nature invented suffering. And the big question is, why? All I can say is, nature uses it to invent. That's the theme in The Lucifer Principle, the first book, that nature does what Michelangelo does. Michelangelo sees a big block of marble, and he sees how by meticulously chipping and chipping away, he can eventually liberate that form from the marble. When someone does pass away, when, when a great thinker does die, he becomes alive in a new way. I have to make sure that when I die, his ideas are still around. People like Howard, they're visionaries. And visionary people are not confined to their lifetime with their visions.
so the product of what they think and act is not limited to whether that will see the fruits happen in their lifetime It's adorable. I could never have imagined when I was 12 years old that I could have a life that's been thoroughly involved in so many different areas. All of our lives have meaning. because we are part of a multi-generational collective search engine that spans the world and each of us is a feeler stretching in a different direction testing out another little set of possibilities um for the larger mass which includes us our parents our grandparents our great great grandparents and kids who haven't been born yet I'm trying to leave a life that gives that permission to follow all of their curiosities no matter what wise men and parents say. And if you work with extreme diligence You can pull off things that everybody around you felt were impossible or that you felt were impossible. Not a single human on planet Earth can remember names. You know, we all think other people can remember names because they're all trying to look like they can remember names because they think everybody else can remember names and only they forget names. So if you have your name on your shirt, that means you're not going to have a person who found you interesting who for four months doesn't dare approach you because he's embarrassed about not being able to remember your name. Look at the social scripts that we follow, and if they're dysfunctional, invent new ones. Well, having your name on your shirt is a new one. and it helps I went on Facebook and I told my audience that I need a girlfriend a bunch of people slammed me and said this is not the kind of thing to talk about on Facebook and one woman I'd never heard of before came to my defense. Uh -huh. You're here. And I said, "Well, would you be interested in a relationship?" And she said, "Well, yes." She's in South Africa. So I call her or Skype her, and we have a wonderful, 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 astonishing, unbelievable time together. Mm -hmm.